yes. Um, firstly, to start with the uh, presentation, um, I want to ask something more specific. Uh, recently, there has been a, a discussion about the language of Aisha. And I want to ask the question can, given the acceptance of the hadith being so authentic, can, can a Muslim act adequately uh, believe that the age of Aisha was uh, nine when she married? Um, without contradiction, or does what do you mean without contradiction? Um, to to say that, that that there may be another birth uh, hadith uh, from a different source that may contradict the age, um, or th does the study of the hadith entirety lead to sort of an agnostic position on her age? You seem agitated about this. <laughs> yes. Uh, what is your agitation? Why are you so uncomfortable? I, I'm not so uncomfortable about it, but some people are. Uh, it's what makes you uncomfortable? No, I'm not uncomfortable about it. What makes... <laughs> Why, what makes you uncomfortable? In the context of now. If I want to look at my view... I think, I think the question is more to do with later sources such as Ibn Hisham and Tabari and uh, Babakad Ibn Sahad. They have reports which appear to identify a different age. Um, Tabari says she was nine when... Tabari has a very interesting quote. No one ever cites it. Tabari says they signed the marriage, they did the marriage contract when she was six, but she was young. And it's Sagira to Ala al-Jama'ah. She was too young to have, to have, to have sex. And so they waited. And then they consummated the marriage later. So this is, uh, I don't, I've looked at all the evidence on these other arguments of how she was older. I don't find it convincing at all. I mean, it's really, I, 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 I understand people why they're making that argument, but I think it's very, their arguments are very weak. You know, that, uh, that, that uh, she shahadat Badr, and that she witnessed the Battle of Badr, and that Ibn Omar wasn't allowed to go to the participate in battle until he was 15. So she must be at least 15. But that's like saying that in order to go to a Manchester United game, that's a, that's a soccer team here, correct? <laughs> What's a London version? Chelsea. 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 Arsenal or something. In order to go to an Arsenal game, you have to fulfill the physical requirements of the athletes in the game. Which is utter nonsense, because uh, she didn't participate in the battle. Obviously. My question wasn't an ethical question. No, yeah. I, I was asking more from the science of Hadith. Than the science of Hadith is that the Baisha says, the Prophet consummated the marriage with me when I was nine years old. That's what the Hadith says. There's an authentic Hadith in Bukhari. And even if you don't want to say that Bukhari is, you know, his book is the most authentic, you, I mean, it's the most explicit data you have on this issue. And everything else is implicit, derived from very tenuous assumptions about uh, culture or something, or, or, or practice at the time. So would you say that anyone would go against the uh, understanding of her being a nine years old is implicit information rather than... I think it is, because you have to look at... This is a very interesting issue. Okay, this is a very interesting issue. <coughs> Non-Muslims, from the life in the community of the Prophet in Medina, from his opponents in Mecca, to John of Damascus, died 749 in his polemics against Islam, to uh, Matthew of Paris in the 1100s, to uh, Voltaire, to uh, Gibbon, to the Chanson de Roland, to uh, anybody who wants to insult the prophet. They had tons of information. They they want they they were looking for anything they could use to insult the prophet, and they his sex life was target numero uno. It's in the Quran, the issue of Zainab and Zaid. I mean, this is we have document during his own time. People said you're committing incest because adopted children are like regular children. This is true in Near East. This is true in the Roman Empire, in Roman culture, and the Quran says no, they're not. This was the biggest, if you look at the instances in which the Zayd Zainab affair is mentioned by critics of the Prophet from his lifetime until 1900, you will not, you will run out of, you know, <coughs> check marks on the paper before you 
count the number of times this story is used by opponents of Islam. They make they also insult him for marrying Aisha. Why? Because he was so obsessed. He's so lustful. He's such an uh, he's such an id-driven creature. I don't believe this. Just in case someone is recording this, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just quoting the opinion of others. He's such an id-driven creature that he has this fantasy of Aisha, a dream about her, and he wants to marry her. No one ever mentions her age, ever, that I found. Until 1905, uh, the British historian David Margoliath has a book on the rise of Islam, the Prophet in Islam. And he mentions this, and he says, it's an ill-advised union. For how else should we characterize the marriage between a man of 53 and a girl of 9? This is the first I've ever seen that anyone mentions this. Why is that? Why is that until the early 20th century? No one talks about this. When they are, good, they are making stuff up about the prophet to insult him. And they don't bring this up. Because they were all marrying underage girls too. I mean, you have to understand that pre-modern, in fact, even today, peasant societies, to use the Marxist term, you know, societies where you have the vast majority of people live in small agricultural communities and agricultural work is the predominant form of, of, of livelihood. Marriage is very early, especially for women, generally right after puberty. And as I, as I tell my students, yeah, yeah, Gandhi got married very young. Because you have to remember, and I've said this before in other lectures, and I think it's very important, our notions of what you're supposed to do in life are based on our lifestyle. If you don't have high school and college or whatever, college and university and, you know, medical school and you have to go get a job, if you're just living in the desert and you're tending goats all day and you're a good boy and you go through puberty and being a boy, <coughs> male who's gone through puberty, I can tell you, speak for the rest of the men out there, basically 99.9% .9 of your brain at that point is occupied with sex. And I don't know what the percentage is for women, but I assume that women at some point start getting interested in sex too. And uh, you're sitting out there with goats, and you've got nothing to do. You have no hope in your life of ever doing anything except tending goats. Why in God's name would you not get married? It makes no sense. Of course you should. And they're like, oh, but you're not emotionally mature. What? What is that emotional mature? What does that mean, emotionally mature? This guy doesn't know what emotionally mature is. He's a, he, he doesn't... People don't think about that. Well, what about, you know, power dynamic in the relationship? What? Power dynamic in the relationship? This is all not... This is all, this is all completely anachronistic concepts we're imposing on the past or on societies that justify we maybe don't care about this. So my, my the argument, they won't, no one mentioned this because it wasn't a concern. And England, interestingly enough, well, historically has relatively high marriage ages, even in the Middle Ages, in the mid-20s. Mid England's a very odd place historically in that sense. But the, uh, this starts becoming an issue in the 20th century, and Muslim writers start dealing with it. And the interesting thing is, who's the, who are the people who start dealing with this issue first? It's not the ulama. It's people like Abbas Mahmoud al-Aqad, the Egyptian prose writer, poet, who died in 1964, who's... He's an anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist. He's not an Islamist. He's not... Uh, he's first and foremost about interested in reviving the identity of Egypt, of, of his community, of his world, of defending it against the West. He, he sees that appreciating and understanding early Islam is important to us. So he writes lots of books on the Prophet and the, early, on the Companions. And he's the first person I've seen who takes up this issue of trying to, to, to try and figure out a way to argue that Aisha was older. He said she was 14 or 15. But uh, because he's concerned about the image in Western eyes. Because in that point, if you look at like, fatwas in Egypt, you start getting federal requests <coughs> saying, why, why is it, you know, isn't it bad that uh, there's an old man marrying a young woman? Shouldn't we have a law against this? Uh, shouldn't we have a law? In 1923, the Egyptian law changes and makes 16 the minimum age for, for marriage for women. 
in Syria around the same time you get it at, at 18, 16 or 18. This becomes a big deal in debates over law in Muslim countries, importing Western legal codes. And a lot of ulema fight against these marriage age restrictions. And they only accept them as procedural restrictions. That they say a Sharia marriage is valid with uh, the, the, the agreement is valid at any age. <coughs> the consummation should only take place when the woman is physically able to bear it, which is the traditional pre-modern Sharia rule. But the ruler, as the ruler, has the right to restrict procedurally what can be registered as a marriage. And you see scholars like Ali Tantawi in Syria, like uh, um, Abdul Halim Mahmoud in Egypt, who defend the idea of making marriage age 16 or 18, because they feel this is actually a good way to promote social welfare. But you can't say, from a Sharia perspective, you cannot say that what the Prophet did was wrong, because the Prophet can't commit sins. 